understood Betsy. 6. Elizabeth Ann fails in an examination. I wonder if you can guess the name of a little girl who, about a month after this, was walking along through the melting snow in the woods with a big black dog running circles round her. Yes, all alone in the woods with a terrible great dog beside her, and yet not a bit afraid. You don't suppose it could be Elizabeth Ann? Well, whoever she is, she had something on her mind, for she walked more and more slowly, and had only a very absent-minded pat for the dog's head when he thrust it up for a caress. When the wooded road led into a clearing, in which there was a rough little house of slabs, the child stopped altogether and looked down, began nervously to draw lines in the snow with her overshoe. You see, something perfectly dreadful had happened at school that day. The superintendent, the all-important, seldom-seen superintendent, came to visit the school, and the children were given an examination, so he could see how they were getting on. Now you know what an examination did to Elizabeth Ann, or haven't I told you? Well, if I haven't, it's because words fail me. If there is anything horrid that an examination didn't do to Elizabeth Ann, I have yet to hear of it. It began years ago before ever she went to school, when she heard Aunt Frances talking about how she had dreaded examinations when she was a child, and how they dried up her mouth and made her ears ring and her head ache and her knees give out all weak and her mind a perfect blank, so that she didn't know what two and two made. Of course, Elizabeth Ann didn't feel all those things right off at her first examination, but by the time she had several, and had rushed to tell Aunt Frances about how awful they were, and the two of them had sympathized with one another and compared symptoms, and they wept about her resulting low marks, why, she not only had all the symptoms Aunt Frances had ever had, but a good many more of her own invention." Well, she had had them all, and had them hard this afternoon, when the superintendent was there. Her mouth had gone dry, and her knees had shaken, and her elbows had felt as though they had no more bones in them than so much jelly, and her eyes had smarted, and oh, what answer she had made! That dreadful tight panic had clenched her throat, and whenever the superintendent had looked at her, she had disgraced herself ten times over. She went hot and cold to think of it, and felt quite sick with hurt vanity. She, who did so well every day, and was so much looked up to by her classmates, what must they be thinking of her? To tell the truth— she had been crying as she walked along through the woods, because she was so very sorry for herself. Her eyes were all red still, and her throat sore from the big lump in it. And now she would live it all over again, as she told the Putney cousins, for of course they must be told. She had always told Aunt Frances everything that happened in school. It happened that Aunt Abigail had been taking a nap when she got home from school, and so she came out to the sap house where Cousin Anne and Uncle Henry were making syrup, to have it over with as soon as possible. She went up to the little slab house now, dragging her feet, hanging her head, and opened the door. Cousin Anne, in a very short old skirt and a man's coat and high rubber boots, was just poking some more wood into the big fire, which blazed furiously under the broad flat pan where the sap was boiling. The rough, round hut was filled with white steam and the sweetest of all odors, hot maple syrup. Cousin Anne turned her head, her face red with the heat of the fire, and nodded to the child. Hello, Betsy. You're just in time. I've saved out a cupful of hot syrup for you, all ready to wax. Betsy hardly heard this, although she had been wild about wax sugar on snow ever since her very first taste of it. "'Cousin Anne,' she said unhappily, "'the superintendent visited our school this afternoon.' "'Did he?' said Cousin Anne, "'dipping a thermometer into the boiling syrup. "'Yes, and we had an examination,' said Betsy. "'Did you?' said Cousin Anne, "'holding the thermometer up to the light and looking at it. 
"'and you know how perfectly awful examinations make you feel,' "'said Betsy, very near to tears again. "'Why, no,' said Cousin Anne, sorting over syrup tins. "'They never made me feel awful. "'I thought they were sort of fun. "'Fun?' cried Betsy, indignantly staring through the beginnings of her tears. "'Why, yes, like taking a dare, don't you know? "'Somebody stumps you to jump off the hitching post, and you do it to show them. "'I always used to think examinations were like that. "'Somebody stumps you to spell pneumonia, and you do it to show them. "'Here's your cup of syrup. "'You'd better go right out and wax it while it's hot.' Elizabeth Ann automatically took the cup in her hand, but she did not look at it. But supposing you get so scared you can't spell pneumonia or anything like it, she said feelingly. It's what happens to me. You know how your mouth gets all dry in your knees? She stopped. Cousin Ann had said she did not know all about these things. Well, anyhow, I got so scared I could hardly stand up and... "'made the most awful mistakes. "'Things I know just as well. "'I spelled doubt without a B "'and separate with an E, "'and I said Iowa was bound on the north by Wisconsin, and... "'Oh, well,' said Cousin Anne, "'it doesn't matter if you really know the right answers, does it? "'That's the important thing.' "'This was an idea which had never in all her life "'entered Betsy's brain, "'and she did not take it in now.' She only shook her head miserably and went on in a doleful tone. And I said thirteen and eight are twenty-two, and I wrote March without any capital M, and I... Look here, Betsy, do you want to tell me all this? Cousin Anne spoke in quick, ringing voice. She had once in a while, which made everybody from old Shep on, open his eyes, get his wits about him. Betsy gathered hers and thought hard and she came to an unexpected conclusion. No, she didn't really want to tell Cousin Anne all about it. Why was she doing it? Because she thought it was the thing to do. Because if you don't really want to, went on Cousin Anne, I don't see that it's doing anybody any good. I guess Hemlock Mountain will stand right there, just the same, even if you did forget to put a B in doubt. "'and your syrup will be too cool to wax right "'if you don't take it out pretty soon.' "'She turned back to stroke the fire, "'and Elizabeth Ann in a daze found herself walking out of the door. "'It fell shut after her, "'and there she was under the clear pale blue sky "'with the sun just hovering over the rim of Hemlock Mountain. "'She looked up at the big mountains, all blue and silver, "'with shadows and snow, "'and wondered what in the world Cousin Ann had meant.' Of course, Hemlock Mountain would stand there just the same, but what of it? What did that have to do with her arithmetic, with anything? She had failed in her examination, hadn't she? She found a clean white snowbank under a pine tree, and setting her cup of syrup down in a safe place, began to pat the snow down hard to make the right bed for the waxing of the syrup. The sun, very hot for that late March day, brought out strongly the tarry perfume into a bucket, and already half full hung a maple tree. A blue jay rushed suddenly through the upper branches of the wood. His screaming and chattering voice sounded like a noisy child at play. Elizabeth Ann took up her cup and poured some of the thick, hot syrup out on the hard snow, making loops and curves as she poured. It stiffened and hardened at once, and she lifted up a great coil of it through her head back and let it drop into her mouth. Concentrated sweetness of summer days was in that mouthful part of it still hot and ar aromatic, part of its icy wet with melting snow. She crunched it all together into a delicious big lump and sucked on it dreamily, her eyes on the rim of Hemlock Mountain, high above her, the snow on its bright golden in the sunlight. Uncle Henry had promised to take her up to the top as soon as the snow went off. She wondered what the top of the mountain would look like. 
Uncle Henry had said, the main thing was that you could see so much of the world at once. He said it was so odd the way your own house and big barn and great fields look like little tiny things that haven't any account. It was because you could see so much more than just the... She heard an imploring whine, and a cold nose was thrust into her hand. Why, that was old Chep, begging for his share of the wax sugar. He loved it, though it did stick to his teeth so. She poured out another lot and gave half of it to Shep. It immediately stuck to his jaw, and he began pawing at his mouth, shaking his head like Betsy had to laugh. Then he managed to pull his jaw apart and chewed loudly and visibly, tossing his head, opening his mouth wide till Betsy could see the sticky brown candy draped in melting festoons all over his big white teeth and red gullet. Then with a gulp he had swallowed it all down and was whining for more, striking softly at the little girl's skirt with his forepaw. Oh, you eat it too fast, cried Betsy, but she shared her next lot with him too. The sun had gone down over Hemlock Mountain by this time, and the big slope above her all deep with the blue shadow. The mountain looked much higher now, and the dust began to fall, and loomed up bigger and bigger as though it reached to the sky. It was no wonder houses looked small from its top. Betsy ate the last of her sugar, looking up at the quiet at the quiet giant there, towering grandly above her. There was no lump in her throat now, although she still thought she did not know what in the world Cousin Anne meant by saying that about Hemlock Mountain and her examination. It's my opinion that she had made a good beginning of an understanding. She was just picking up her cup to take it back to the sap house when Shep growled a little and stood with his ears and tail up, looked down the road. Something was coming down that road in the blue. Clear twilight something that was making a very odd noise. It sounded almost like somebody crying. It was somebody crying. It was a child crying. It was a little, little girl. Betsy could see her now, stumbling along and crying, as though her heart would break. Why, it was little Molly, her own particular charge at school, whose reading lesson she had heard every day. Betsy and Shep ran to meet her. What's the matter, Molly? What's the matter? Betsy knelt down to put her arms round the weeping child. Did you fall down? Did you hurt yourself? What are you doing way off here? Did you lose your way? I don't want to go away. I don't want to go away, said Molly over and over, clinging tightly to Betsy. It was a long time before Betsy could quiet her enough to find out what had happened. Then she made out between Molly's sobs that her mother had been taken suddenly sick and had to go away to a hospital, and that left nobody at home to take care of Molly, and so she was to be sent away to some strange relative in the city who didn't want her at all, and who said so right out. Elizabeth Ann knew all about that. Her heart swelled big with sympathy. For a moment she stood again out on the sidewalk in front of the Lathrop house, with old Mrs. Lathrop's ungracious white head bobbing from a window, and knew again that ghastly feeling of being unwanted. She knew why little Molly was crying and she shut her hands together hard and made up her mind that she would help her out. Do you know what she did right off? Without thinking about it, she didn't go and look up Aunt Abigail. She didn't wait till Uncle Henry came back from his round of emptying sap buckets into the big tub of his sled. As fast as her feet could carry her, she flew back to Cousin Anne in the sap house, I can't tell you, except again, that Cousin Anne was Cousin Anne, why it was that Betsy ran so fast to her, and was so sure everything would be all right, as soon as Cousin Anne knew about it. 
But whatever the reason was, it was a good one, for though Cousin Anne did not stop to kiss Molly, or even to look at her more than one sharp first glance, she said after a moment's pause, during which she filled a syrup can and screwed the cover down very tight, "'Well, if her folks will let her stay, how would you like to have Molly come and stay with us, till her mother gets back from the hospital? Now you've got a room of your own, I guess if you wanted, you could have her sleep with you.' "'Oh, Molly, Molly, Molly!' shouted Betsy, jumping up and down, and then hugging the little girl with her might. "'Oh, it would be like having a little sister!' Cousin Anne sounded a very dry warning note. Don't be too sure her folks will let her. We don't know about them yet. Betsy ran to her and caught her hand, looking up with her shining eyes. Cousin Anne, if you go to them and ask them, they will. This made Cousin Anne give a little abashed smile of pleasure, although she made her face grave again at once and said, "'You've better go along. Back to the house now, Betsy. It's time for you to help Mother with supper.' The two children trotted along the darkening wood road, Shep running before them, little Molly clinging fast to the older child's hand. "'Aren't you ever afraid, Betsy? In the woods this way?' she asked, admiringly, looking about her with timid eyes. "'Oh, no,' said Betsy, protectingly. "'There's nothing to be afraid of except getting off the wrong fork of the road near the wolf-pit.' "'Oh, wow!' said Molly, sh screeching. "'What's the wolf-pit? What an awful name!' Betsy laughed. She tried to make her laugh sound brave like Cousin Anne's, which always seemed so scornful of being afraid. As a matter of fact, she was beginning to fear that they had made the wrong turn, and she was not quite sure that she could find the way home. But she put this out of her mind, and walked along very fast, peering ahead into the dusk. "'It hasn't anything to do with wolves,' she said, in answer to Molly's question. "'Anyhow, not now. It's just a big, deep hole in the ground, where a brook had dug out a cave.' Uncle Henry told me all about it when he showed it to me, and then part of the roof caved in some time. There's ice in the corner of the covered part all the summer, Aunt Abigail says. Why do you call it the wolf pit? asked Molly, walking very close to Betsy and holding very tightly to her hand. Oh, long ago, ever so long ago, when the first settlers came up here, they heard a wolf howling all night, and when it didn't stop in the morning, they came up here on the mountain and found a wolf had fallen into it and couldn't get out. My, I hope they killed him, said Molly. Gracious, that was more than a hundred years ago, said Betsy. She was not thinking about what she was saying. She was thinking that if they were on the right road, they ought to be home by this time. She was thinking that the right road ran downhill to the house all the way. And this certainly seemed to be going up a little. She was wondering what had become of Shep. Stand here just a minute, Molly, she said. I want, I just want to go ahead a little bit and see. And see, she darted on around a curve of the road and stood still, her heart sinking. The road turned there and led straight up the mountain. For just a moment the little girl felt a wild impulse to burst out in a shriek for Aunt Frances and to run crazily away anywhere so long as it was running. But the thought of Molly standing back there trustfully waiting to be taken care of shut Betsy's lips together hard before her scream of fright got out. She stood still, thinking— now she mustn't get frightened. All they had to do was to walk back along the road till they came to the fork and then make that right turn. But what if they didn't get back to the turn till it was so dark they couldn't see? Well, she mustn't think of that. She ran back, calling, Come on, Molly, in a tone she tried to make as firm as Cousin Anne's. I guess we have made the wrong turn, after all. We'd better... But there was no Molly there. In the brief moment Betsy had stood thinking, Molly had disappeared. The long, shadowy wood road held not a trace of her. 
Then Betsy was frightened, and then she did begin to scream at the top of her voice, Molly, Molly! She was beside herself with terror and started back hastily to hear Molly's voice, very faint, apparently coming from the ground under her feet. Oh, oh, Betsy, get me out, get me out! Where are you? shrieked Betsy. I don't know, came Molly's sobbing voice. I just moved the least little bit out of the road and slipped on the ice, began to slide, and I couldn't stop myself, and I fell down into a deep hole. Betsy's head felt as though her hair was standing up straight on end with horror. Molly must have fallen down into the wolf pit. Yes, they were quite near it. She remembered now that big white birch tree stood right at the place where the brook tumbled over the edge and fell into it. Although she was dreadfully afraid of falling in herself, she was cautiously over to this tree, feeling her way with her foot to make sure she did not slip, and peered down into the cavernous gloom below. Yes, there was Molly's little face, just a white speck. The child was crying and sobbing, holding up her arms to Betsy. Are you hurt, Molly? No, I fell into a big snow bank, but I'm all wet and frozen, and I want to get out. I want to get out. Betsy held on to the birch tree. Her head whirled. What should she do? Look here, Molly, she called down. I'm going to run back along to the right road and back to the house and get Uncle Henry. He'll come with a rope and get you out. At this, Molly's cry rose to a frantic scream. Oh, Betsy, don't leave me here. Don't, don't. The wolf will get me. Betsy, don't leave me alone. The child was wild with terror. But I can't get you out myself, screamed back Betsy, crying herself. Her teeth were chattering with the cold. Don't go, don't go. Come came up from the darkness of the pit in a piteous howl. Betsy made a great effort to stop crying. She sat down on the stone and tried to think. And this is what came into her mind as a guide. What would Cousin Anne do if she were here? She wouldn't cry. She would think of something. Betsy looked round her desperately. The first thing she saw was a big limb of a pine tree, broken off by the wind, which half lay and half uh, slantingly stood up against a tree a little distance above the mouth of the pit. It had been there so long that the needles had dried and fallen off, and the skeleton of the branch with the broken stubs looked like. Yes, it looked like a ladder. That was what Cousin Anne would have done. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Molly, she called wildly down to the pit, warm all over with excitement. Now listen, you go off there in a corner, where the ground makes a sort of roof. I'm going to throw down something you can climb up on, maybe. Oh, oh, it'll hit me, cried poor little Molly, more and more frightened, but she scrambled off under her shelter obediently while Betsy struggled with the branch. It was so firmly embedded in the snow that at first she could not budge it at all, but after she cleared that away and pried hard with the stick she was using as a lever, she felt it give a little. She bore down with all her might, throwing her weight again and again on her lever, and finally felt the big branch move. After that, it was easier, as its course was downhill over the snow to the mouth of the pit. Glowing and pushing, wet with perspiration, she slowly maneuvered along the edge, turned it squarely, gave it a great shove, and leaned over anxiously. Then she gave a great sigh of relief, just as she had hoped. It went down sharp, and the first struck fast into the snow, which had saved Molly from broken bones. She was so out of breath that her work, that for a moment she could not speak. Then, Molly, there! Now I guess you can climb up. See if I can reach you. Molly made a rush 
for any way out of her prison and climbed like a practiced squirrel that she was up from one stub to another to the top of the branch. She was still below the edge of the pit there, but Betsy lay flat down on the snow and held out her hand. Molly took hold hard and digging her toes into the snow, slowly wormed her way up to the surface of the ground. It was then, at that very moment, that Shep came bounding up to them, barking loudly, and after him, Cousin Anne, striding along in her rubber boots, with a lantern in her hand and a rather anxious look on her face. She stopped short and looked at the two little girls covered with snow, their faces flaming with excitement, and at the black hole gaping behind them. "'I always told father we ought to put a fence round that pit,' she said in a matter-of-fact voice. "'Some day a sheep's going to fall down there. "'Shep came along to the house without you, and we thought most likely you'd taken the wrong turn.' Betsy felt terribly aggrieved. She wanted to be petted and praised for her heroism. She wanted Cousin Anne to realize, oh, if Aunt Frances were only there, she would realize— I fell down the hole, and Betsy wanted to go and get Mr. Putney, but I wouldn't let her, and so she threw down a big branch, and I climbed out, exclaimed Molly, who now that her danger was past took Betsy's action quite as a matter of course. Oh, that was how it happened, said Cousin Anne. She looked down the hole and saw the big branch and looked back and saw the long trail of crushed snow where Betsy had dragged it. N well now that was quite a good idea for you little girls to have she said briefly i guess you'll do to take care of molly all right she spoke in her usual voice and immediately drew the children after her but betsy's heart was singing joyfully as she trotted along clasping cousin anne's strong hand now she knew that cousin anne realized she trotted fast smiling to herself in the darkness "'What made you think of doing that?' asked Cousin Anne presently, as they approached the house. "'Why, I tried to think what you would have done if you'd been there,' said Betsy. "'Oh,' said Cousin Anne. "'Well,' she didn't say another word, but Betsy glanced up at her face as they stepped into the lighted room, saw an expression that made her give a little skip and hop of joy. She had pleased Cousin Anne.' That night, as she lay in her bed, her arm over Molly cuddled up warm beside her, she remembered ever so faintly, as something, of no importance, that she had failed in an examination that afternoon. 